Hey everybody, I'm the Drink Pro. Today I'm doing a side-by-side -side of Old Forester birthday bourbon. What's up everybody? Kyle the Drink Pro here with you yet again. Thanks as always so much for liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing these videos with your friends, and being a part of the Patreon. Anything you guys do to help support the channel is incredibly appreciated. And I will say, I'd love it if you take a minute and share this video with one other person you know that likes bourbon or whiskey or drinking in general and wants to learn more about it because that kind of friend to friend, mouth to mouth, that's a little weird way of saying it. <laughs> Word of mouth, really, is how I'm able to keep doing this channel. Anyway, I'm really excited today because I'm getting to try three different editions of the Old Forester Birthday Bourbon. The 2020 Old Forester Birthday Bourbon just hit recently in September, about a month ago now, and people went crazy for it, as they usually do. But I will say it's becoming more and more crazy. Each year that passes, bourbon becomes bigger and bigger, the whiskey becomes harder to find, and the hype grows even greater. Uh, I just saw a recent picture from a local liquor store from 2013 with Birthday Bourbon just sitting on the shelf and and Blanton's collecting dust. That doesn't happen anymore, unfortunately for some of us, and fortunately for others. Now, the Old Forester Birthday Bourbon is actually a relatively new release. They started releasing them in 2002, and have done one every year since. Now, the Birthday Bourbon is released every year on September 2nd, and this is in honor of the birthday of the founder of Brown Foreman. George Gavin Brown was born in 1846 in Munfordsville, Kentucky. Very young, he was the head of his family as the Civil War kind of separated his family apart and forced some of the older men to go off to war. So he started working relatively young and feeling that kind of responsibility. In his teens, he actually uh, was selling pharmaceuticals and he kept hearing from people complaints about how the whiskey they were drinking was not very uh, quality controlled, we'll say. At this point in time, medicinal whiskey was still considered legitimate and people didn't know what they were going to get from their medicinal whiskey. That's something that uh, Brown kept in the back of his mind. Eventually, in 1870, George Garvin Brown joined with his half-brother, J.T.S. Brown, to form, you guessed it, the J.T.S. Brown Distillery. One of the things that they did that a lot of other people weren't doing at the time, remember, this is 1870, they were bottling their whiskey in glass bottles that were sealed, as opposed to selling it in barrels, which was relatively common at the time. This was sort of a de facto quality control, and this is kind of before Colonel E.H. Taylor makes it onto the scene, pushes the Bottled and Bond Act to make sure we have quality control at the government level. Well, the Brown Foreman, which we'll get to that in a minute, at the time it was J.T.S. Brown, was actually doing sort of quality control before it was in vogue, you could say. In 1890, the JTS Brown Distillery partnered with a man named George Foreman, not the fighter, and they joined together and created the Brown Foreman Distillery. George Foreman actually died very shortly after that, so he's not remembered as much in the history, if you looked it up and you read about this company, as Mr. Brown is. I think in part because he just wasn't involved with the company as long. Besides putting their whiskey in sealed glass bottles, it's worth noting that the Brown Foreman Distillery had a flagship line that's still a line we know today. Old Forester. Now, Old Forester is actually named after a Civil War doctor. Dr. William Forrester, for a while, was actually sort of a spokesman that worked with Brown Foreman promoting this whiskey for medicinal purposes. You start to see the connection, the pharmaceutical sales, trying to have the standardization and make it feel more like medicine. There's a lot of connections here that you can kind of put together and understand the picture of what was going on at the time. One sort of anecdote I find pretty funny is that Old Forester today is not spelled the same way as it was when it was first released in 1870. Part of that's because Dr. William Forrester had a falling out with Brown Foreman, but he couldn't get them to take the name off of the bottles. So he thought about his name, which was spelled with two R's, and in response, Brown Foreman changed Old Forester to have one R. <laughs> that's that's just really funny to me. They couldn't use the name, but they got damn close. Now today I've got three different editions of the Old Forester Birthday Bourbon. I've got the 2014, I've got the 2017, and I've got the 2020. I want to give a couple shout outs now because I really appreciate the people who are providing me with these samples. So big shout out to Gregory Lane for providing me with the Old Forester 2020. Big shout out to John Warner for providing me with the Old Forester 14 year. Now the 2017 Old Forester was given to me by somebody who chooses to remain anonymous. And I'm actually kind of excited about that because I've been working on a fun animation to celebrate my anonymous donors. So thank you, Mr. Anonymous.
that was just a fun animation. I had to make that. It just really gave me a big goofy smile on my face when we decided to make that. So big shout out to Eric Andrews for helping me with that one. Let's get into the details on these bourbons, shall we? Now, the birthday bourbons that I have in front of me were all very close in proof. They just have 1% alcohol difference between them total. The 2014 edition is 97 proof, the 2020 edition is 98 proof, and the 2017 edition is 96 proof. One other thing that's really worth noting though is a slight difference. The 2020 is a 10-year-old whiskey blend, whereas the 17 and the 14 were 12-year-old whiskey blends. It's also worth noting that the 2014 and the 2017 had more information about them released at the time. Unfortunately, I can't find some of that 2014 information. I didn't have it written down anywhere, and it's harder to find on the internet than it may have been at the time, just because they've archived that data on the Old Forester website. But the 2017, you can still go to their website and read about how many barrels, where they were located, and uh, you know some of the, the, the elements of the blend that show up in the taste of the whiskey. That kind of information doesn't exist for 2020. 2020, they just say, here's the proof, it's 10 years old, and it makes up 95 barrels that went into this blend, and, and the bottling is the equivalent of the one day's production of Old Forester. Now, the mash bill of Old Forester typically is 72% corn, 18% rye, 10% malted barley. We know for a fact that that's the mash bill of the 2017 Old Forester uh, birthday bourbon, but we're sort of guessing that that's consistent throughout the different years. That information wasn't released on the website, so I'm not certain about that, but I think it's a safe guess. While the 2020 only had 95 barrels, the 2017 was more, it had 120 barrels. And I've got a little bit of information about where those barrels were stored. 93 of those barrels were stored in Warehouse G on the fourth floor, and 27 of those barrels were Warehouse K on the fifth floor. Those two locations came together to make the 2017 birthday bourbon. Again, we don't know the locations of the 2020, but the 2014, we don't have a barrel count, but we also do know the locations. These were in the middle of the warehouses, G and I. Part of why that's important is understanding the effects of the temperature and location and humidity and the type of warehouse on the whiskey. Those are factors that affect the palate, which we're going to get into now. So I'm gonna start I'm gonna do them in the right order here. I wanna actually be a little bit more precise. Sometimes I get a little sloppy with this. So the 2020. Got the 2014. Oh man, I'm spilling everywhere. I'm making a mess, guys. All right, and now the 2017. Now something I always like to do with my whiskeys, I've lined them up here. We got the 2020, 2017, 2014. Um, I'm gonna give them a real big nosing on each one and then kind of talk about the differences and then maybe get into more detailed notes on each palette. So they're all actually more similar than I thought they would be. Um, I guess because it's, you know, individual releases that maybe they were going for specific profiles each time. I sort of assumed it might be a little bit different, something more like Booker's where you have unique presentations each time, but these all smell very similar. Um, I think the first one is the most caramel sweet. It's almost got that sort of old, uh, sort of more aggressive sweetness that I expect from older whiskeys. It's something I've gotten from a couple of the dustier pours that I've had in the past. That starts to show up a little bit on the 14. That really sharp, super sweet vanilla. Lots of caramel as well. I get some cinnamon and some baking spice. Really heavy baking spice. Lots of sweet and baking spice. There is some fruit quality to it. I would say there's some peach and some cherry, maybe some grape and some lemon. There's a lot of different fruit notes, but they're relatively quiet. You have to go hunting for them. It's very complex, but it's not very loud. That sharp, sweet grain note really is predominant on the nose for me. And as I smell it, it's getting creamier over time, which is kind of fun. Okay, let's move to the nose on the 17. Now I will say right off the bat, it's a lot less of that sharp sweetness that I get from the 2014. The wood shows up a lot more. It's almost got a peanutty quality. There's a nuttiness. There's definitely an oakiness. Some vanilla. Still a little bit of that baking spice, but it's much quieter than it is on the 14. And I think the fruits are less diverse on the 17. The 14, I got, you know, four or five fruits, I think I listed off. On the 17, I'm really getting cherry, and maybe a little orange, and maybe a little lemon, but predominantly cherry, which is really interesting. To me, the 2017 is 
much oakier, almost nutty, and then you get predominant cherry. It kind of reminds me in some ways of a Stag Junior, except with a lot less proof, obviously. That sort of banana bread quality is in there as well, which is really nice. The baking spices are quieter on this, but they're in this sort of bready construct, so they feel more prominent than they are because you're imagining a whole flavor. To me, with the 14, it's like a piece of caramel candy and then super baking spicy and fruity underneath, but it's just predominantly sweet caramel for me. The baking spice and the bready sweetness on the 17 really complement well, and you get this baked good with a hint of cherry, maybe like a, oh, I don't know, a cherry baked cinnamon loaf, something like that. Let's go to the 2020. Wow, very different. Uh, first off, the banana shows up, but it's more like a banana runts kind of thing. It's not the uh, banana baked bread, at least not comparatively, not side by side. The banana has much more of an artificial quality to me. You can kind of tell it's a little younger, to be honest. There's less of that oakiness that I was getting from the 17 edition. The big sweet caramel isn't as developed as the 14. I'm not saying it's not good. It definitely is. I really enjoy the uh, the baking baking spice is just a consistent note with all of these. But I think the uh, the cinnamon is the least prominent for me in 2020. It's some other kind of baking spice. Maybe a little bit of clove. I get a, maybe a touch of mintiness in 2020 that doesn't appear for me in either of the other. I get a little coconut, a little mango. There's a lot of tropical fruit going on to me in 2020 that I don't get at all in these earlier ones. All right, let's go ahead and give it a taste. Yeah, 2014 is sweeter on the nose than it is on the palate. Oh, but it's got a beautiful presentation. It's sweet without being overpowering, and then you get this great slight oaky, slight nuttiness in the mid palate. The finish is pretty short though, I must say. I kind of expected a longer finish on this one. Yeah, vanilla caramel, maybe a hint of honey, a little bit of that cinnamon, uh, like a raw cinnamon in the mid palate, also becomes kind of herbal. You definitely get this like walnut, slightly bitter, slightly nutty quality. The oak is pretty prominent. But what lingers at the end, um, the finish isn't oaky, which is what I expect because you get like oak near the end of the mid palate. But the finish is sort of this warm cinnamon baking spice kind of, uh, not sweet, but like all the other elements from like a bread, uh, you know, like a dessert bread or something. Let's go ahead and taste number two, 2017. A lot creamier, a lot less sweet. Mid palate is still very nutty. I'd say it's even nuttier and oakier than the 2014. Ooh, and there's some black pepper spice showing up. That's really good. Yeah, that oakiness is a lot more prominent. Yeah, lots of fruit on the palate. So instead of tasting that super sweet uh, honey vanilla caramel, on this one, I get lots of fruit up front. Apples, cherries, oranges, maybe a little bit of honey as well. And then man, that mid palate comes in hard. It's much spicier than 2014. Black pepper, cinnamon, uh, maybe an almond. Yeah, like an almond expert. Ugh, Ooh, it tingles on my tongue. And this might be, yeah, this is the lowest proof of the three. So that's pretty interesting. Man, that black pepper, that's got a really nice, long, toasty finish. Very, if you like an oakier version of Old Forester, this is really looking like the winner. Let's try 2020. Oh man, I don't know. It's definitely got the tropical fruit, but it's it's creamier. It's the creamiest one. Um, but it just kind of falls away. It's not nearly as complex as 17 um, and not as sweet and sort of classic as 14. Yeah, it's very well balanced. I think it's the most balanced of the three, but it's actually kind of to its detriment because 14 and 17 take you on a journey. And 2020 just kind of sits there and just is like, this is a really good whiskey presentation, which is fine. But, you know, in 2014, this was a $60 whiskey. Now it's $130 whiskey MSRP. If you can find it for that, good luck. It's mostly 600 plus on the secondary market. So I kind of expect more maybe from a whiskey with twice the MSRP, but it's two years younger. Yeah, creamy, more chocolatey. I get chocolate, which I don't get in the other two. 
yeah, honey, sweetness, and chocolate in the, in the beginning. Mid palate gets a little bit bitter. That chocolate becomes like a dark chocolate. And there's not really nuttiness, but there's definitely oakiness. Well, I take that back. Maybe there's a little bit of nuttiness. A little bit of almond, but it's not as prominent as it was on 17. You also get the heat and the pepper that you got on 17 in 20. Uh, but it's not as lingering. The wood doesn't come out. It's less oaky and more just black peppery. Yeah, when you go back to 14, it just tastes so much sweeter than these other two. But it also is really missing that long, oaky finish. If you guys watch the channel, you know I'm a sucker for a fruity whiskey. I think 27 takes the cake for me. I love the cherry. I love all the fruity notes on the initial tasting. And then it has a really cool evolution. I feel like 2020 falls a little bit flat for me. And 2014 might be the favorite for a lot of people. It follows a very classic bourbon profile, but it falls away at the end. And I feel like I'm missing something. I feel like 2017 is the best of both worlds. So I would probably go 17, 20, 14. That's just for me personally. Feel free to hate on me in the comments if you want to. Thank you guys so much for watching. Y'all keep drinking like professionals. Cheers.